Day five of my trip along the Shannon begins in Banagher, where the Shannon separates County Offaly from County Galway. As we set off on our journey towards Loch Derg, I have a great sense that we're about to have a very lively discussion. Well, my interest started off because I got a letter saying there was a pipeline proposed to take water through my farm to Dublin. So selfishly I said, oh, that doesn't sound right to me, like something's wrong. People said to me that it can't be stopped, it's inevitable that this pipe is going to go through. But the more and more we look into it, the more and more ridiculous it's getting. When you actually look at the water levels on Loch Derg, on Loch Ree and on Loch Allen, and the knock-on effect that the drought had the whole length of the Shannon, if this pipeline takes four cubic metres a second out of the Shannon at Perty and Weir, you will have a knock-on effect in a drought like last summer, which is going to be completely exaggerated. Irish Water talk about taking 2% of the annual flow of the Shannon. That's irrelevant when you have a flood, but that's going to be a disaster if you have a drought like you had last summer. Now, if there's a drought and with global warming, who knows what kind of summers we'll have in years to come, it's just not feasible. Plus the fact there are alternatives. There are aquifers, there's underground water, and relying on one source like the Shannon doesn't make sense, either economically, but mainly for our point of view, it's environmental. Okay. Just worry about the long-term effects of abstracting water, particularly in drought. And the drought time is when Dublin would be needing it most. I still believe that it is not the best way of meeting Dublin's real needs uh, uh, for water because I think there are very many other ways which would be better and cheaper for Dublin. The best way to promote waterways appreciation and use is to get a lot of different people involved, whether it's younger people like we're talking about today, whether it's different communities whether it's walkers, cyclists, canoeists or boaters. We're talking about several generations. All those different people appreciating the waterways and then from whatever's going to happen in terms of development, infrastructure or otherwise, there will be a body of interest there to be engaged with and they in turn can help promote what needs to be done to preserve good use for waterways. Dublin uses 300 million litres of water a day. It has available to them 600 million litres of water a day. On the worst day of the drought last summer, they were short 5 million litres of water. The proposal is to take 330 million litres out of the Shannon. There is absolutely no need for Dublin to have accessible to it 940 million litres of water a day. There is no city of 10 million people with that sort of water available to them. No country in Europe uses systems like Irish water are using to justify projected growth in demand. If any factory with water demand wants to come to Ireland, where's he going to go? Where the 940 million litres are available? Dublin. It's not necessary, it's just giving Dublin the future that the rest of Ireland deserves. Why am I, as a taxpayer, paying to take a pipe to Dublin to give Dublin all the future? Because this water is not necessary up there, but if they create the demand up there, Dublin is going to become a mega city because they're going to have the supply of water capable of doing it. So that's a very interesting point, that the availability of water is going to determine economic growth of a particular area. Yes. So Shannon has the water, so really, in an ideal world, economic development should actually be coming towards the Shannon, not the other way around as is happening. The greatest amount of water ever used in Dublin was 315 million litres in one day. Okay. They will have available to them 940 after this pipe is built. The waterway system is the most magical place, really, that I've ever experienced. The very essence of being on the water, it's so peaceful, it's so tranquil. There's people who've developed the ideas of trails. Donald Boland, for instance, is trying to develop a tranquility trail. Bernie Moran, who runs Native Guide in Moat, she is doing some work on monastic sites that were on higher parts of Ireland in the Midlands and is trying to chart all the routes that might have taken place between different 
monasteries. Just the sense of enjoying life and being able to appreciate life, really, I think, from, from a lot of different points of view. For me, at the centre of it that needs to be the spiritual needs of the people mm. who live and work and play around the banks of the Shannon. We need to develop a future for them where they can live in their own places, where they can have good prosperous lives in their own places. So we do need development along the Shannon of one sort or another, but it needs to be very carefully crafted development mm. so that it doesn't damage the natural heritage, the built heritage, the cultural heritage, which we all value so very much. The Shannon Waterways Corridor to designate the waterway plus also the land around the waterway as a protected landscape. Mm. And within that, the state land, and there's a lot of state land that is owned, to designate that as a Shannon National Park. The Shannon Basin actually has a population similar to the size of the population of Dublin. And that's what people forget. So politically, it should be as powerful an area as Dublin. But people seem to get involved in a politics that doesn't work in rural Ireland. At best, since the famine, the population is falling or stagnant at best in the Shannon catchment area. Right? So, yes, we do need to improve tourism, we do need to improve agriculture, we do need to improve the amount of employment that is being produced by tourism and <coughs> agriculture. Tourism is all very well, it employs a certain number of people. If we are really going to develop the rural part of Ireland, we do need industry. Industry that will require water. But why do I wake up and read the paper and listen to the radio and hear about a new tube out to the airport, a new runway, a new this, a new that in Dublin? an incinerator inside in the middle of the city, a hospital inside in the middle of the city. And where I live is dying. If you go to other towns along the area, up through Atlone, 20 miles left and right of the Shannon, they're all struggling. And we're electing representatives in every election who play the system. They get a net for the back of the goals in the hurling field. They get a walkway around the soccer field. And we're all supposed to be happy. At the moment, the system is not working for rural Ireland. If the population of an area has fallen for 150 years, maybe we should start asking questions of our politicians to know why are we not getting the development that Dublin's getting. If you go to the north of Italy, around the Italian lakes, there's much more development there than there is here at the moment. But what you find is every little valley has its own small light engineering business. Mm. People have good, well-paid employment. And we can do the same sort of thing here if we only focus on going about it the right way. And that will be the saving for the communities and the towns in the Shannon Corridor. They can't get housing in Dublin. Semi-detached, ordinary houses for seven, 800,000. Out of the reach of anyone but millionaires. And yet we have towns with empty housing. Why not move people out of Dublin? No, why Towards does everything have to be in Dublin? When you have a government that bring in a spatial strategy that say there is nobody going to get assistance unless he's in a town of 10,000 people plus, that means towns like Nina, Turles, Burr, Rosgrave, Lockray, Balnasloe are never going to get a penny of investment again. I dispute that. But so the, 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 the spatial strategy stays it. Tipperary is actually not even mentioned in it. To concentrate its resources in places where it can build sustainable development, which does happen to be based on a certain base of population. And that's the way things have developed internationally. You look at other communities that have dispersed and just died because they've been too distributed. Yeah, but if you actually look at the Shannon well. Basin, one third of the population of the country live in the Shannon's Drake mm -hmm. catchment area. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that there's only one town in that area which is at Lone now, maybe I'm wrong, but that's the only town that's entitled to any development. No, of course But not. that is the, what the spatial strategy is saying. It's not. It's highlighting it is. that as the centre of population. <laughs> <There's a plan. laughs> but this, before this, we, before I, we this, this, that. this has been a very robust conversation, and I suppose really what I have heard is that the Shannon is a vital lifeline in the country, that the communities along it are in decline in some ways, while there is uncontrolled growth in Dublin to a certain extent and we need to redress the balance. There's a lot of conflict over how we use the Shannon and I suppose at the end of the day we're all going to have to work together on it. May I finish perhaps with a little poem? My heart certainly echoes W.B. Yeats in his great poem The Lake Isle of Inish Free. I will arise and go now for always night and day. I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core.
when I arrive in Gary Kennedy, I head straight for Larkins on the shores of Loch Derg, where I meet up with renowned whistle player Fiona Gardner in session along with Porrick Highland and Niall Hellebert. <laughs> Day six of my journey along the Shannon begins in Gary Kennedy on the eastern shore of Loch Derg, a very popular stop-off point for people cruising along the river. and I are really looking forward to arriving in Limerick City by evening time. When I got married 50 years ago this year, I actually moved to County Kildare and oh my God, how I miss the Shannon. The parish is an island and consequently, most of the people there way back made their living in salmon fishing. The Abbey fishermen, they were put off the Shannon by Ardna Crusha. And there's a very, very famous battle. It's called the Battle of the Tail Race. When they began to build Ardna Crusha, when the poor salmon came up the river to spawn, they were caught in the turbines and just made mincemeat of. The salmon fishermen took up the cause and they got 24 boats to go up the tail race to fish, despite the fact that they had been banned from fishing. Consequently, the bailiffs came, confiscated the boats, put them up into Sarsfield barracks. The bats was a swimming area that was constructed with dressing rooms and so on. Today, unfortunately, you can't swim there anymore because a lot of damage has been done to the Shannon by way of pollution. There are a number of organisations and individuals have done huge work in preserving the heritage, like the Heritage Boat Association, who have documented the histories of pretty much all the working boats that are or were on the Shannon. I think a lot of the history is there. What we're probably losing is the oral history. The old boatmen are dying out. I knew one of the last of the Abbey fishermen, Cyril Mulcahy. As far as I know, he was one of the last to have actually fished in that area. The people who operated the spoon dredgers are gone. So we've lost that and we don't know how that work was done. So I, I think that's that's a pity, but you know, we haven't lost it all. There's still a lot of good stuff being done. There's more history there that we can't even imagine. You know, we keep on digging and finding new stories and, and more stories. I think it's important that we make an effort to connect children and bring them out, show them the waterways, bring them to the river's edge and go for walks, talk and explore the different senses with them. If you're watching water on the telly, they don't get to touch it and put their hand in and have that experience. So. We need to pass the Shannon on to the coming generation. Our children, our grandchildren, and those come after them. The Shannon is their inheritance, it's their legacy, and they're entitled to have it passed on in as pristine condition as we can manage. There's an obligation on us to do all we can to make sure that that happens. We do that by guarding against any harmful effects that can come about as a result of over-exploitation, pollution. There are those who would seek to over-exploit the Shannon for financial gain and for many wrong reasons. If we don't fight against this over-exploitation, we won't have a Shannon with integrity. It will be a degraded river because you cannot take and take and take and take. 
and we have seen around the world the results of over extraction. It's frightening if you study it at all. We have the opportunity here in Ireland to do the proper thing. Okay. Right. Get the children to talk to their grandparents, to talk to their own parents, their memories of the river. My mother would hand us bottles of milk. There were lemonade bottles and a glass newspaper kind of folded like a cork. Tell the children that's the way it was. I mean, I'm looking at my own grandchildren at home and my husband is saying to me, take those things off them, they're not talking. I'm sure every grandparent is despairing because you'd love a child to talk to you. If you go way up north up the river, up into Acres Lake, there's a beautiful new floating boardwalk which brings people literally right down onto the water and they can appreciate all the various things that are going on, the wildlife and so on. And at the same time, they're on a safe boardwalk. I know one of the great pleasures of my own life is bringing my two grandchildren out in our canoe. And they get such fun out of just being in a little canoe paddling close to the water. It really does bring them very close to it. But of course, nobody sees that. That's not a disaster story. So that kind of story doesn't make a lot of attention. I think there's actually a lot of good stuff going on. But we now have two white-tailed eagles nesting and breeding on the Shannon. The Shannon has lots of islands in it with lots of trees. It's suitable habitat for these majestic birds. And it's a joy to see the eagle, massive wingspan, swooping down and just like that, taking up a fish in its claws and back to the nest. And you know that they're either feeding themselves or feeding young, but they have successfully bred for the past three or four years. So it's a great thing to see, but we have to protect it. I suppose the Shannon, it continues to inspire writers and poets. It always has done, and some of the beautiful pieces that come out from people just by sitting there looking at the river, looking at the sunset and the sunrise and seeing the magical colours that you can't really see in other parts along the coastline. And that's what makes it kind of magical and unique, just to sit there and listen to the sound of the birds and the sound of the lapping water. That's constant through time. That'll still be there for our grandchildren and their children, and that will remain the same, I think. A nine o'clock twilight, and rooks roost on ruddock's trees. Their raucous cawing leaps across the lax weir to bounce on the old toll house. Our small boat sighs forward with each dipping of paddles, creating a widening V in the summer smooth Shannon. I, man and oar, sunburn stinging my neck after a picnic day on St. Thomas Island. Dad begins to sing, There's a tree in the meadow, points to me for the next line, a tree passing by, my brother for the next. And where'er I go, you'll always know I love you till I die. The old grey heron stands still in the shallows under the metal bridge. We ruffle his feathers and he shifts from one leg to the other until we glide by, turning into the Abbey River on an easy ebb tide home. I spent the last night of my trip along the Shannon in Limerick City where I had the great pleasure of meeting up with students from the Irish World Academy of Music and Dance at UL. 